Today on Muscle Car, we'll show you a pile of different ways to plug those pesky trim holes in your sheet metal. Then our Olds Resto Mod gets a high-end steering system. Flashback looks at what some consider to be the coolest AMC ever built, and then we check to see if our big old brakes will work with our big old rollers. Hey guys, we're making some pretty good headway here on our Oldsmobile, and the first thing we're gonna hit on today is repairing these trim holes on the fenders. Now, it doesn't matter with what you're working with at home, the chance of you running into having to fix some of these things is probably pretty good. Now this is just your typical old trim hole. It's not too involved to have to repair or feel something like this one. Where this one, on the other hand, is totally different. You can tell that somebody's done some filing, probably to adjust that clip to get the trim to line up just right. So, got to do a little shaping on this thing to make it easier to fill. Now, our first order of business is filling these plain Jane holes. I've got a couple of different ways I want to show you. Y'all check it out. Now, the first technique I'm going to show you is using a piece of copper pipe that we flattened out and made what I call a spoon. You place it up against the back side of the panel and it lets you fill up the hole really easily because the steel from your weld won't stick to the copper. A minimum amount of grinding to clean up the welds and you're in business. The next technique we're gonna do is weld in a plug or a patch or whatever you wanna call it. And I'm gonna use this old piece of speaker deck that come out of the O's because it's the exact same thickness as the body and it's free so I can save a little bit of money. What I'm gonna use is this little crimp punch tool that we got from Matco. It makes these perfect little circles that is ideal for this situation. As you can see, it makes perfectly round plugs that you can use on your panels. Well, our plug is a little bit too big, so we need to open it up just a bit. With that step drill, get a chamfer that hole, give me a nice spot to weld in, we're ready to go. A couple of taps with a hammer will counter any pulling that the heat from the tack will give you. Then burn it in. Now I've showed you a couple different ways to kind of do the same thing, but this one is going to be a little bit different because of its odd shape. Come over here and let me show you what I'm talking about. Now you could take the time and cut this odd shape out, but really and truthfully, there's a better and faster way to do this. First, I'll use a step drill to make a nice uniformly shaped hole instead of that old oddball one that we had before. Then I can create my own plug by drawing it out from the front side with a replacement metal on the back side. The closer to the proper shape that you can trim it will save you a lot of work after it's welded in. Now the last way I want to show you is taking an oversized patch or plug and sliding it onto the back side and then taking the welder and filling the hole up. If you can't hold it easily with a clamp, try a magnet to hold it in place. Now from this side, there's definitely nothing wrong with the panel. Problem is, See, if anyone was ever looked from the back, it don't look that hot. Now, some of this sheet metal work that we've done today, a few of you guys may be intimidated by it, but really and truthfully, it's kind of like the old saying, if the turtle never stuck his neck out, he would never get nowhere. Coming up, we build the steering for our Oldsmobile and then take a look at a classic AMC wrapped up in the good old red, white, and blue. Well, I'm glad you guys made it back. We've definitely been chopping some cabbage when it comes to working on our old Oldsmobile. Next thing we're gonna do is mount up our steering column. Now, as for the column itself, we went all out. We chose an IDEDIT steel retrofit column. They've already done all the homework to make sure that this thing fits just right. IDEDIT also offers all the goodies that mount up your steering column. Let's say you're going for that stock look, 
they have these that give that factory look. Or if you're going the custom direction like we are, they have this polished double D shaft and the shiny joint. And check this out right here. We also got their touch and go keyless ignition system. Now all you gotta have is a key fob close to the car and you can start it with this cool little push button. Now to mount up our column here on the top side, I'm gonna use this stock upper bracket, but our problem isn't there. It's down here on the bottom where we made this custom firewall. I've gotta figure out where exactly I need to punch a hole in so that we can stab the column through it. And then I use a piece of exhaust tubing and I bevel the end of it. That way, whenever it slides in, you go flat up against the firewall. Also using that long piece of tubing, you can tell if that column's leaning one way or the other. That's it right there. Now looking at the inside at the firewall, we've got plenty of room on the top and the bottom. We could come down a little bit or up a little bit if we needed to adjust. But there's one other thing you need to consider. That is what's going on out here. Now oftentimes you run into some type of interference with the header, inner fender, or even the frame rail. What you want to keep in mind is to find the best route to get from here down to your steering gearbox or rack, whichever you have. Now this is kind of whenever that calibrated eyeball kind of comes into play. Right along here, per se, is the edge of our frame rail. The diameter of our steering column is approximately two inches. So let's say that's about an inch, and that would be another inch. So our steering column would be in between there. I'm gonna drill through this side with an eighth inch drill bit. That way I know exactly where to drill from the inside out. The factory bracket bolts right in the same location on our I did it column. And we can begin installing it. The next thing we need to consider is the lower column mount. Now what I've used several times is an old piece of exhaust tubing and a hose clamp. All you have to do is simply slide it on along with the hose clamp. And we'll tighten this thing up a bit. What you want is this thing to just barely be kind of snug on the column. Now if you're going with a column that's painted, you want it a little bit more loose. That way whenever you paint it, it still fits in the hole. You can see whenever we start sliding this thing up, it starts pushing out on the top of there, so we need to open that up just a bit. Well, looks like our sleeve fits. Now I just need to tack it into place. I'm going to pull our inner fender out to make a little room to work up front. And with the column removed, a trip around the sleeve with a body saw using a hose clamp as a guide, we'll take off some of the excess tubing. Now once this lower tube gets completely welded to the firewall, all we have to do is take that clamp, loosen it up, slide it up, and with that slit cut into the tube, it'll tighten up around the steering column, giving us a good solid mount. That's all it is to making a good, sturdy support for your column. Stick around and find out how AMC was looking to eat into the big three with its Revel machine. And then the Olds gets a set of monster discs for big stopping power. Today's flashback, a 1970 AMC Rebel machine. Muscle cars have always been a symbol of America's rebellious spirit. And to drive that point home, the folks at AMC love to wrap their cars in the good old red, white, and blue. In October 1969, they rolled out their latest patriotic pavement pounder, a slick mid-sized car with plenty of fireworks under the hood. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Machine. AMC took their ordinary Rebel and souped it up with a Borg Warner T10 four speed, pulling a set of 354 gears. Extra stiff rear springs and anti sway bars front and rear gave it great handling on the road, but the real story was under the hood. A 390 V8 pumping out 340 horsepower. 
This was the same engine used in the AMX, but it got 15 more horses thanks to its free breathing design. The Ram Air Scoops combined with free flowing intake, dog leg heads, and lower restriction exhaust made it one of the best breathing engines AMC ever offered. It's also the most powerful in AMC history, and the hood mounted tack still keeps track of all that power. Tires were E60 by 15 polyglass wrapped around specially designed steel wheels. Machines were also unique from the standard Rebel in the fact that they used the grill from the 68 models. I have wanted a machine ever since I was 14 years old. I wound up buying that first car for 150 bucks. I actually took delivery of it on my 16th birthday. This particular car my brother found for me. He knew that I've loved machines for a long time, so he called me and asked me if I was interested in it. Uh, I told him absolutely I was interested in it, and I spent about five years doing a ground-up restoration on it. The first thousand or so machines only came in this red, white, and blue scheme. After that, you could get one in any factory color, but all that flashy style ended once you climbed inside. It looks like a taxi cab. The Spartan interior came only in black, and gauges, well, they weren't anything special either. High back bucket seats with a tricolored armrest were the only amenities. The Rebel Machine was AMC's attempt to further attract young buyers to the showroom. Originally it was going to be a more menacing black car with black wheels, but AMC decided to go with a more eye-catching look. Similar to its Scrambler from the previous year. Like that car, it was designed as a limited edition and only had 2,326 units sold. This was one of about 500 that are still around. The Rebel line would wind up getting scrapped in 1971 and replaced with the Matador. You could order the machine option on that car, but the engine was downgraded and only about 50 people chose that package. Only one is known to still exist today. Among collectors, the 70 Rebel machine is known to be one of the finest cars that AMC ever produced. It's a car we can all agree deserves a salute. Coming up, we'll take a look at how you need to check your wheels for clearance after a brake installation. Well, we have absolutely no problem in that direction. Okay, guys, you can see we've got the old Cutlass back up in the air again. And here's the reason why. Up underneath the front end with everything we've got on our chassis now on our driveline, we've got tons of custom-made moving parts. So we're going to go ahead and mock up the brakes on the front end just to make sure everything fits with no interferences. One of the reasons we're going to do this mock-up on the front brake system and the suspension is because of these spacers we're going to use right here. They're made out of billet aluminum and we're putting them inside the car in order to widen out our front track. The reason we went ahead and widened out the track was because we want a better fit of our wheel and tire combination up inside the wheel well. Now when the suspension travels up and down and turns all the way to the left and all the way to the right, we have to make sure we've got enough clearance both at the chassis and out here on the sheet metal. So we'll mock it all up, stack all the pieces together, and then we'll see what we end up with. These are actually the parts we're going to use to mock up the Oldsmobile, and judging by the size of these things, they're going to give us plenty of stopping power. This Willwood Big Brake Kit includes four piston calipers for the rear, six piston calipers for the front, and they're all going to clamp onto these big 14-inch drilled slotted directional rotors. This particular kit is built for wheels that are 17 inches in diameter and larger, and ours are 19, so we shouldn't have any problems, but Willwood also makes kits for wheels all the way down to 14 inches in diameter. These parts are also good for racing applications, and certain sanctioning bodies require that the bolts be safety wired, and in case you have to do that, they come pre-drilled and ready to go. But luckily for us, it's going to be a street car, and we'll just lock tight them and we'll be good to go. And one other thing you guys might want to know, many of Willwood's components come in different finishes so you can match them to whatever look you're going for with your car. We need to pull off the spacer so the rotor can fall in behind it on the spindle. Then I can start mounting the brake hardware beginning with this caliper bracket. Soon we're ready for that big old rotor and I'll slip the caliper on to see how it all fits. Okay, right now I've got the caliper pushed down onto its bracket and I can feel that the caliper is just touching the rotor. So these kits come with shims from Willwood that will allow us to space the caliper out so that it doesn't contact the rotor when we're putting it together. Still just a little more. 
With the rotor moving freely and no interference from the caliper, that means we've got our fit down and the spacer can go back into place. Now we've got to test these tires and see if they can turn and spin freely in both directions. Well, we have absolutely no problem in that direction. And we have over a half an inch of clearance in this direction on the chassis. Looks like we're gonna be okay. Should not have any issues whatsoever with everything mocked up the way it is. Now that we've got all the components on, everything's stacked up, everything looks good. We've got all the clearance we need. We have one small issue though. Tom, looks like we may need to change the studs. They're just a little too short. Well, you probably ought to write that down because with your old age and all, man, you know you're bad about forgetting. I forgot my pen. Here, you might want to use mine. I forget all the time. Hey, young kids, I don't know what I'm... If you've got any questions about anything you saw on the show today, go over to PowerBlockTV.com.